You know, when we were just singing that chorus, Jesus was crucified, laid behind a stone, and like a rose he trampled on. How many know we have to carry our crosses too? And just like he allowed himself to just be trampled on like that, we're asked to do the same. And 2 Corinthians 4 and 10 says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 10, when Paul explained that, he was, let me show you on the screen. I got my Bible on the, uh, my tablet here. And I have it highlighted there at the top. We repeat in our lives what he did on the cross. And why? So that just like he resurrected, resurrection happens in us. Let's read that verse 10 together. Is it big enough to read? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And then if you keep reading, we're always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus might be made. He repeats himself. And that, we've been kind of focusing on that the last few weeks. And... I want to begin and really talk about the cross and the full victory. How many want the full victory of the cross? We got victory, didn't we, when we were saved? That gave us victory. We're not on our way to hell. He saved us. He took our sins that separated us between us and God, separated us from God. He took that out of the way. We're with God now. But now that we're saved, we don't and this is, you're going to hear me say a lot of this next little while because I really feel to focus on this. We don't just come to church to just clock in time and say, well, as a Christian, you go to church. As a Christian, we've got to let that life of Jesus that Paul just talked about manifest in us. He said, I'm carrying a boat in my body. Do you ever study the book of Acts and see how Paul was persecuted so severely? He was beaten five times with rods. He was stoned. He was left for dead. He spent the night floating on a board after a shipwreck. And he was doing all of this for the Lord. And he said, people might not see what I understand about those experiences. That, when you do it for the Lord, you're suffering like Jesus on the cross. How many know he suffered so we could be saved? Well, Paul was suffering so people could be saved too. Now, of course, Paul's blood's not going to save anybody like the blood of Jesus did and does. But God still uses that and says, there's a child of mine that's taking up his cross and he's suffering. I'm going to cause the power of my spirit to flow through that person. And that is what we need to do. Have that life of Jesus manifest in us. So it's not just coming to church. What are we doing every day? What are we doing in our regular living that's letting that light shine, that people could see it. And some people say, well, I don't go there and I don't go here and I don't do what I used to do and there needs to be a change in our lives, right? We shouldn't go to the things we used to go to. We shouldn't do the things that are sinful that we used to do. And, but that's not all that letting our light shine is. It's, it's actually God working through us and doing something. And we need the work of the cross to help us get there. And I'll explain it as we go on. Um, we're going to read to the beginning here with Genesis, where the devil came in the Garden of Eden to Genesis 3. And I want to show you something. We touched a little bit about this last week. And how many remember last week I said, there's a whole bunch of scriptures I can't get to. I'm just going to, well, I want to get to some of them today. When, he, when the devil went into that garden... He focused on the woman. Why did he go for her? Why didn't he go for the man, Adam? Why was it her? And notice I didn't say Eve, I said woman. Does anybody know when she got her name Eve? It was after they sinned, after God was kicking them out. 
And after Adam was hearing all these curses, he heard one thing God say to that serpent that gave Adam hope. And it's like, man, when you're hearing nothing but curses and bad news and God just told you off for eating that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and he distinctly told you not to do it, Adam was just looking for some kind of glimmer of hope. And when he heard God say to the devil, the seed of the woman shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He said, seed of the woman. Seed of, there's going to be a baby born from the woman that's going to crush that serpent's head one day. And it's Jesus, isn't it? Praise God. Did you see the passion of the Christ and where the snake's head was stepped on when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane? Notice Adam was in the garden when this happened. And it was in the garden God told that serpent, the devil, the seed of the woman's going to crush your head. And when they made that movie, they put that together. They got a hold of some Bible scholars and they advised them, have the heel crush the serpent's head in the garden because Jesus was in a garden too and do you remember is it um, 2 Corinthians 5 1 Corinthians 15 and 45 calls Jesus the last man Adam do you understand what the Bible means when it calls him Adam the first Adam of course was the failure the loser <laughs> the one whose wife tempted him and he sinned well, that Adam was given dominion and power over the whole earth. And here our leader over the earth blew it. The devil moved in. And remember what the thief comes for? To steal, to kill, and destroy. What did he steal? He came to steal power over the earth. And that's why the Bible started calling him the prince of the power of the air. The, the, the king of this world. He stole that from Adam, and we lost our leader. So what did God do? I'm going to not only save man and bring man back and have a plan for him to get back in touch with me because now that touch is broken, they're lost, they're on their way to a devil's hell. I didn't create hell for man, I created it for the devil and his angels, but now hell hath enlarged herself. Now it's going to contain more than what it should have. So... God himself came down in fashion as a man, took upon him the form of a servant, was tempted in all points like us, and he went to a garden too. Where Adam, the first Adam, was defeated in a garden, Jesus was going to win in a garden. And he went in there, and that's where he actually died. I know he died on the cross, and he had to go to the cross. He had to shed his blood. But he made up the decision when the temptation was so strong Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What did he mean by this cup? He meant that experience, that whole plan of going to that cross, suffering and dying. His flesh didn't want to do it any more than yours would. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's where the decision was made. That's where the serpent's head started to have that pressure put on it. But when he died and gave up the ghost and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and he he let, gave his last breath. That's when the serpent's head was just crushed the rest of the way. <laughs> but way back, why did he go after the woman? You see, the woman was the means by which Adam would multiply and fill the earth. Everybody say, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and have dominion over it. Subdue it. Those were the commands given to Adam in Genesis 1 that he would have dominion. And in order for him to have dominion, he'd have to multiply over the earth. And he would multiply himself, and it was the woman that he would multiply himself through. So the devil says, I'm going to get a hold of his means. And you know it's the same way today. How many know the church is the bride? And Jesus is the groom? And if Jesus is the groom, and he's called the last man Adam, who's the church in relation to an Adam? It's like we're the last Eve. And Jesus, through the church, is going to multiply himself, just like Adam would multiply himself through the woman. And just like the devil went after the woman, he's going after the church. But how many are going to not do what the first Eve did? We're going to hold on and let, the first, let, let this last Adam guide us. 
We're going to go by what He wants us to do, not what we want to do. Amen. Praise God. And so, look at this. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Genesis 3 and 3, this is the woman explaining to the serpent why she couldn't eat of that fruit that the devil told her to eat. Of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Notice that one little three-letter word, not. God said, you shall surely die. The devil threw the little three-word, you shall not surely die. One word. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. The devil tried to make her think, he's holding back on you, woman. There's something you could have that God's holding back from you. And you know, isn't that like the world today? Where the world is saying, God's holding stuff back from us. I mean, they're getting blatant about it now. It used to be that people say, I don't believe in God. But now some of them are coming around. Atheism is really turning evil. I guess you couldn't even really call it atheism if they think this way. But some of them, they know there's a God. But he's holding back on us. And they never said anything that wicked before. But they're saying it now. And, and I even heard people take like the book of Job. A man wrote a whole book on this. And it's on Amazon. I can't remember what it's called. But I put a remark. If you ever go find it on Amazon, you'll see my remark. <laughs> but they said that, why would God be so cruel to make Job suffer like he did? Why did God let Job go through that? It's like they're acknowledging it really happened, but they're angry with God for doing it. Now that's different from saying, well, I don't even believe he exists. This is worse. Oh, he exists all right, but he's cruel. And I put a note on there. I said because it was a foreshadow of what ha would happen with Jesus and how mankind. And I did an elaborate explanation, and, and I don't know if anybody ever responded. Sometimes they even get arguing on those re remarks. But I said, I'm not going to keep quiet here. I'm saying something. About but that's what this book was about. But he's holding back on you, woman. He knows that if you get this, you're going to be better than what you are. And he got her to start focusing on herself and forgetting about everybody else. And this is what happens every time when people get messed up, even Christians. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree, and here it is, to be desired to make one wise. See, just like I have underlined up top, you shall be as gods. She said, It'll make me wise. This tree will make me wise. She took of the fruit, ate, give also unto her husband, and he did eat. So she lost sight of the bigger picture. She focused on the smaller picture of what she wanted, her wishes, her life, her position. I ain't going to be like God. And that was the devil's road to get into her life. Don't focus on yourself when you want the greater good. See, this is how we can learn from this. We want to do God's will. We don't want to get messed up and we find out, well, how, God, what do I have to avoid? What do I have to stay away from in order to do your will? And God's word's telling us right here, whatever appeals to you to make you front and center, to promote you and put you out in the limelight, run away from that as fast as you can. And I'm going to show you why. If she didn't let the devil get her to focus on herself, and you know something? Think of it really carefully. There would be no problems in our lives if we'd do this. If we would not focus on ourselves, there'd be nothing he could have taken. No, nothing. She wouldn't have to die. You'll die, God says, if you eat of that fruit. And he, the devil, wanted her to die. I've got to kill her. I've got to kill her. And I'm going to come right out and tell her she won't die. And then I'm going to try to make her... I'm not just going to throw a hook out there. What kind of insane fisherman would just throw a hook in the water and think he's going to catch fish? What do they do? They hide the hook with something that the fish likes. And see, that's like the devil. He wants to kill us. But he's not just going to throw a hook out there. He's going to hide the danger like the devil was doing with the woman with something that appeals to our flesh. And our flesh likes this thing about being front and center. Our flesh likes this being 
Me, me, me. But what I'm saying is that the enemy will try to appeal to you to twist and to focus you to eventually die. And so, now, how many know Satan was in the serpent? If you go away to Revelation 12, the end of the Bible, chapter 12, verse 9, it says, the great dragon... Oh, yeah, by the way, the world didn't end yesterday, did it? Anybody stop and think of that today? September 23rd, Zen's coming. September 23rd came and went. You know, there's some hurricanes before September 23rd. There was some fires and stuff like that. But they said that yesterday, the lion constellation and the stars was going to rise. And then the Virgo, the virgin, was going to be clothed with the sun. Just like Revelation 12 says, if you go back to verse 1. And... Uh, and Peter and I were talking about this too, and, and Elton, I was chatting with Elton this week, and um, we were just talking about church and God, and, and he said, do you believe the world's ending September 23rd? I said, no. I said, I just told the church the other day, God's not going to use a horoscope and an astrology symbol to talk about what the book of Revelation's talking about. Virgo, folks, isn't the virgin. <laughs> that's, that's a witchcraft horoscope constellation that people try to track their lives with, and that's, that's demonic. In fact, if you ever read the horoscope, you need to ask God to forgive you. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. That stuff is witchcraft. And um, what sign are you? I'm the sign of the cross. <laughs> I'm not any of that witchcraft symbol. I'm not putting those stickers on the back of my window, what astrological sign I am. But it's Revelation 12 where they got that nonsense from, and they twisted it. And Revelation 12 isn't saying that, what they're saying. Revelation 12 was talking about the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Notice it said that old serpent. Now, if you read the whole Bible from front to back, and all of a sudden at the back you see that old serpent, what would you think of? There's that serpent in Genesis. That, the word in old in Greek is the ancient, the ancient serpent. Oh, that's the one in Genesis. So Genesis is telling us that that old serpent is called the devil, and it's Satan. Now Genesis doesn't call it Satan and the devil. It calls it the serpent. But here we're finding out why we know that that serpent was Satan. And he deceives the whole world. And aren't you glad? The Bible says God threw him out of heaven, cast him into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. Praise God. So that spirit's evil. Now look at this. You ever hear of Lucifer before? In Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Why? Because, or for, thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of this congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above that. Look how many times he's talking about himself. You know anybody that ever talked about himself so much? <laughs> Red flags should go up. <laughs> Red flags. I, 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 I. I will. I's the middle letter of sin. I's the middle letter of pride. I, I, I. I will be like the Most High. Now, isn't that what the serpent said to the Lord? You will be like God. So what we're seeing is this same evil spirit with Lucifer in Isaiah 14 was being transferred to the woman. I will be like God. And then the serpent got the woman to want the same thing. I want to be like God. It's like we got the devil's own desire. Way back in the Garden of Eden. He says, you want to be like the Most High? You're going to be brought down to hell. You're going to go to the sides of the pit. He said, Notice he said... The last few words there, in the sides of the north. I want to be in the sides of the north. He says, sides? I'll tell you what side you're going to be on. You're going to go to the sides of the pit. And then in Ezekiel 28, he's talking about another evil. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say to him, thus, thus saith the Lord God. Whoever this was, he said, you seal up the sum. Now that's an old King James way of saying, you are filled with this. Full of wisdom. You were full of wisdom. You're perfect in beauty. 
You have, you, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. He said, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He was anointed. He was in the garden of Eden. He had all these jewels all over him. I have set thee so. God put him there. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. You were so close to God, you were on the holy mountain. And according to this, scholars believe that the Garden of Eden had a mountain in it. In fact, on that mountain was the garden. And you remember how it said there was four rivers that flowed out? It would have been like waterfalls going to all the earth. And he was on the mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. One time Moses and 70 elders went up into Mount Sinai to see God and they were on pavement like sapphire. Do you ever see sapphire? A sapphire is like a dark blue stone and it's got like a shine, like a star in the middle of it. Can you walk, imagine walking on pavement of sapphire? It would look like you're walking in the sky in heaven, black and stars all over. And it's like whatever Moses came into, like a holy presence of God with sapphire pavement. And the Bible says God's throne is like sapphire. You were, it's being really close to God. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in you. Now, what kind of iniquity do you think got found in him? Remember Lucifer? What was his problem? Pride, self-exaltation. I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be above the stars. By the way, what does Revelation say the stars represent? Angels. I'm going to be above all the angels. And, and he said this creature was perfect in the ways, from his ways from the day he was created. He was full of wisdom. Then iniquity was found in him. Look what kind of iniquity is. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore, I'm going to cast you as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering care, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. You thought so much of yourself. Remember Narcissus in that old myth? He loved himself so much, he, he just liked to gaze into the water so he could see his face. <laughs> you were lifted up because of your own beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. He was full of wisdom, but all of that powerful wisdom became corrupted by reason of thy brightness. He was filled with himself. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. He said, there's a fire going to burn in you and it's going to kill you. He said, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all that behold thee. Remember there was a king, do you remember his name in the book of Acts, where he was so lifted up and so proud, and he was eaten up with worms while he was sitting on his throne? Anybody remember who that was? There was it was a Herod. Read it in the book of Acts. And look at this, John 10 and 10. That was the devil. Look at what the describes Jesus as. And it begins by talking about the devil again. The thief cometh not but for to steal kill and destroy. But why did Jesus come? I am come that they might have life. That they might have it more abundantly. And notice what Jesus says about himself. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? Gives his life for the sheep. Let's self die. But he, and notice he talks about another kind of shepherd. He's a hireling. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. In other words, forget about these sheep. I'm, I'm, I'm saving my neck. But what's the good shepherd do? The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Somebody say sacrifice. How many want to be like the good shepherd? Do you want to be like a, the hireling? 
Or like the, do you want to be like the thief? Or do you want to be like the good shepherd? The good shepherd sacrifices. Remember last week we talked about how on the news, there's news when, when people want to give. Like yesterday morning, a guy called me up. We got a crane out here uh, just off of 3rd Avenue Northeast in Portage. And it was like 7 in the morning. And he says, we're putting a roof on two houses that we are giving to two families because they can't afford a house. And the boss said, we got to get out there. I drove out. I got pictures. And, and I interviewed the guy because when people are sacrificing for somebody else, that is something beautiful to know. And, and, but if this was just somebody doing it for themselves, I won't say which building it is, but there's another building and they were renovating and changing it. And, there was, and I said, should we get a news story on it? And they said, well, what's it for? And I said, well, they're, they're expanding their business or they're making some kind of housing for people. But yeah, we're, are they giving it away? Oh, no, they're going to be making money. No, we don't want to hear about it. And it's just like good news. The gospel means good news. When you sacrifice for yourself, you're like that good shepherd. You give your life for the sheep. Nothing comes out of your mouth. I'm going to do this, or I'm going to be like that, or I'm going to be front center. Praise God. Nothing like that is there. You let yourself die. Your, your way you talk is a million miles away from that kind of talk. You see, this is we need to know this because we not only need to avoid people that say me, 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 and I, 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 and opinion, 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 we to get away from that stuff, but we need to make sure we don't do that. And if, if we catch ourselves saying, I, me, all the time, we remember, wait a minute, we were preaching, we were getting a message Sunday morning about that's, that's the enemy's attitude. I, I, I want to be, be so far away from that attitude that all that comes out of me is what there is for others, what I can do for somebody else, and maybe what somebody else does so well instead of what I do so well. You ever start talking about yourself and all of a sudden you feel guilty? Boy, that's, I'm just, I'm talking conceited here now, aren't I? You know, praise God. Let God convict us so much that that stuff is gone because it's dangerous. The self-exaltation, it's, it's what the devil had. And I got a bit of that in me. You know, all of us have a bit of that in us and the cross is trying to kill it. The cross wants to kill that stuff so we don't die. And so Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. And the way I'm giving you life is I'm, I'm letting mine go. And, and I will carry my cross. If the wolf comes, I'll lay my life down for the sheep. I'll face the wolf. But you know what a hireling will do? When he sees the wolf coming, he says, I'm saving my own neck. These sheep can die. I'm out of here. And Jesus is comparing what we shouldn't be and what we should be. It says... The, the hireling thinks more of himself than he does the sheep. The wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. In verse 13, the hireling flees because he's a hireling and he cares not for the sheep. If you don't care for someone else, you'll never give your life for someone else. And we need to search our lives because if we're the pe type of people, I don't care about them. I really... I, and that bothers me. I can't be like that. I've got to be caring. I want to be like Jesus. How many want to be more like Jesus? I want to care. And you know, it's like the other day I was reading an announcement for the funerals Saturday morning for the news. And all of a sudden, I literally started breaking when I read there's a 19-year-old kid that died and they're going to have, they're not really even having a church funeral. It's kind of sad, isn't it, that the stuff like that's happening. Not even having church funerals anymore. But it still touched my heart because they're going to do it in a gym somewhere. And they want all his friends to come. And it touches me now, wearing something to do with sports. And I got thinking, that 19-year-old kid was obviously into sports. And they just want to honor him. And that 19 years old, think about it, 19 and he's gone. And, and then I got feeling the presence of the Lord and saying, son, keep on caring like that. Care more. Pray for me to do that in you more and more all the time. Where Jesus, when Lazarus was in the tomb, how many remember Jesus wept? He went outside of that tomb and one verse, Jesus, two words. God wanted it in the Bible. Jesus wept. And they all said, oh, how he loved him. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, Jesus said, by the love that you have one for another. And, and so when the enemy came to bring death, Jesus says, I'm not coming to kill 
steal and destroy. I'm coming to bring life. And it was a greater life and life more abundantly. What do you mean more abundantly? Greater than death is what I mean. You know, death is greater than natural life. Death is greater than mortal life. But praise God, Jesus' life is greater than death. It's not only greater than mortal life, it's greater than death because death can kill mortal life and mortal life can't do anything else about it. But resurrection life is greater than death because you try to kill me, devil, and praise God, I'll raise this body up again in three days. That's why Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And he was talking about his own body in John chapter 2. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Hallelujah. Somebody say resurrection life. And the devil came to man for him to go to that forbidden fruit. He came to steal the world and the dominion over the world. He came to kill and destroy Adam and Eve. And, and when we live our lives the way we want them our way, we are just like the enemy. Our personal likes. No sense of what God wants. You know why it's so easy now for people, especially young people, to be atheists? Because they're just pumped and pumped and pumped in their schools. Do what you want to do. Do what you feel like. If it's good, don't matter what anybody says. Until now, when homosexuality is preached against in the Word, and they know it is, they say, I don't care what God or the Bible thinks. I like it. That's why it's so easy for them to be atheists because that attitude of the enemy, I, 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 me, 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 self, 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 I will exalt myself above the heights of the clouds, that is so rampant in people today. And so parents and young people, especially you guys in school, don't let the devil pump that trash into you. Amen. Make sure you stand on the word of God and say, I'm going on with Jesus. I am not going to have my way because Satan, I know what you'll be doing behind the scenes. You're manipulating even the school system. You're manipulating. You're going after the next generation. You know you can't deal with the adults because they've got their ways set in stone. But you're going after the kids and we're going to go behind those parents' backs and we're going to change the way they think and you can't even stop us. And now you don't even have to get a word from the public schools to know what they're teaching because they don't, they don't have to tell you anything. And it never used to be like that before because the devil is working so strong, he's going overtime now. And he's twisting these, you, 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 you will be like God is actually what he's trying to say. And we need to recognize that. And young people, you need to recognize that as Christian young people, that this our personal likes taking the front seat, no sense of what God wants, no sense of God anyway, no sense of death to our way and death to our life. That's what we got to avoid. Matthew 16 and 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer. Everybody say suffer. Many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. And imagine the disciples hearing this. From that time forth, Jesus never explained any of this before Matthew 16 and 21. They never heard him talk anything like this. He was calling Peter, follow me, Matthew, follow me. And they were all following. They were fishermen and they let down their nets and they, they followed Jesus. And then Jesus, if you go earlier to Matthew 16, he says, who do people say that I am? Well, some think you're Moses and Elijah. Some think you're one of the prophets. Okay, now, what do you think I am? And everybody shut up except Peter. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're not Jeremiah. You're not Elijah. You're not one of the, You're Christ. You're the Messiah, the, one, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, oh, flesh and blood didn't tell you that, Peter. But my Father which is in heaven. And I'm going to tell you something else now. Now that you've said that, now that some of you are starting to hear from God. How many want to see other believers start to hear from God? You know what a pastor wants to do? He wants to see people starting to hear from God for themselves. Hallelujah. Pastors need to be able to hear from God to preach and get messages and all of that. But we want, we want to see some of you hear from God so that maybe in the middle of a meeting, one of you gets a prophecy and you start shouting right out, thus saith the Lord, and we all are taught. Okay, God's finally using somebody else in the congregation now. And then you give a revelation out. Or somebody else, you're, you're led to say this, or you're, I just feel in the spirit. Remember that happened in one of our services? Leslie was here, here, and she says, there's somebody here with a stomach problem. And, and, and Carrie was healed that morning. And, and 
God wants to, that's letting your light shine. That's the ministry coming out of you. And, and Jesus was waiting for that. And when he saw it finally happen, now I can start talking about something. As soon as he saw, wow, flesh and blood didn't tell you that, Peter. You're getting things from the Father now. Okay, from that time forth, now that that happened, Jesus began to show his disciples, somebody say the cross. Oh boy, the Lord's showing me something. See, I'm, right here, watch. The Lord's showing me something right now as I'm talking. Notice, after Jesus said, you're hearing from the Father, then he started talking about the cross. What did Paul say when a verse I mentioned at the beginning of the service happens to somebody that has the dying of Jesus in their body? What's the result? The life of Jesus manifests in their body too. The reason Jesus started, and God's showing me this right now, he started talking to them after the Father started giving them revelations. Is because your flesh has to go through a dying so that more of that light can come out of you. Light just came out of Peter. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't get that from man. You see, when it's light, it's not something you get from man. You don't get it from a Bible school. You don't get it from a book. You get it from the Father. And that light came out of Peter, and Jesus said, now, now it started. Praise you, Father. I imagine the Lord started worshiping. Now, we want to see more of that happen. So, boys, now I'm going to start talking about the cross. Because when that cross, that dying that I'm going to experience happens in you too, there's going to be more of that light come out of you. Because I carry about in my body, Paul said, the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus could come out of me. In other words, he was telling those people, don't get upset with me going through persecutions. Well, pastor, you get stoned five different times. Don't worry about it. You know what's so good about it? What could be good about our pastor being stoned to death? <laughs> the ministry comes out of me more anointingly, more powerfully, more revelation comes out. The life of Jesus has come out of me. Don't fret for me. He said, it's more anointing come out of him. And furthermore, if you deny yourselves too, guess what? That kind of stuff is going to come out of you. But can you see how much opposite that will be in people's lives who are just persecuted? I didn't sign up for that. I'm out of here. I'm going to stay as far away from caring about in my body the suffering of Jesus as I can. Well, you're going to have that attitude? Then the Holy Spirit is going to stay as far away from you as he can and will never use you to let light shine out because you are like a hireling. When you see the wolf, you're gone. But bless God, Jesus said, I give my life for the sheep. And when the Spirit sees that sacrifice, somebody say sacrifice. See, sacrifice isn't just death. It's death for someone else. Sacrifice. Then resurrection comes. It's like you're pulling resurrection like a magnet from God. When you sacrifice and deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. And so that's why Jesus said from that time forward, I've got to go to Jerusalem now, boys. I'm going to suffer many things. The elders, the chief priests, and scribes, I'm going to be killed and raised again the third day. Guess what part Peter never even heard? Raised again the third day. Look at the next verse. Then Peter took him, the very guy that had the light coming out of him there for a moment, the very guy that heard from the Father, and the others never said anything, but the one that did, began to rebuke him. Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Now, why do you think Peter said that? Anybody got an idea of what Peter might have been like? He was the guy, keep in mind, that kind of blew it a lot. <laughs> oh, I'll die for you, Lord. Peter, before the cock throws in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. No, I'll die for you. No, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> Jesus knew him. He knew his heart. Peter wasn't really totally concerned with Jesus as much as he was his own neck. And we find that out when he did go to the cross. You're one of those disciples of his. Ah! Fressin, 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 I never heard of him in my life. And he cursed the Lord and denied him. A little girl, it says a maid. This big man couldn't stand for Jesus in front of a little girl. <laughs> and, and so... 
Peter says, be it far from thee, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said, get thee behind me. And what does he call Peter? Satan. Why did he call him Satan? What was Satan like, that old serpent? You'll be like a god. You, I will exalt. You need to exalt yourself above everybody else. You See, that's why Peter mouthed out and said, I'll die with you. He wasn't going to die. He was doing the opposite. He wanted to exalt himself above all the other disciples. I'll, I'll, see, these guys, they're just sitting there saying nothing, Jesus. I'll die for you. And everybody was looking at Peter. I'm getting the limelight now. I'm getting the limelight now. Well, that same desire came forth after that when it really came down to where the rubber meets the road. I deny him. I got nothing to do with him. Somebody say, deny yourself. He called him Satan because that same self-exalting spirit that the devil was putting into Eve, he, he had it. He said, you are an offense to me, Peter. You don't savor the things that are of God. In other words, you're not willing to sacrifice yourself for someone else's sake, even God's. I mean, it's pretty bad when, when you love yourself so much that God can take a second seat. You're not even thinking of what God wants. And he said, the last thing I need to hear is one of my disciples encouraging me not to take that cross because my own flesh doesn't want to take it as it is. And I don't need one of you encouraging that. I've got to deny my flesh, but I've also got to now deal with you. So Satan, you get behind me. Woo, he dealt with them pretty hard, didn't he? You savor those things that be of men. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, did Jesus say, okay, boys, forget everything I ever said about the cross. I don't want to lose any of you. Forget it. You know, this Jerusalem stuff, being killed the third day, pretend I never said it. I don't want to lose any of you. No, sir. If he was going to lose them, let, let him lose them. He's not going to go against the work of the cross. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And Jesus revealed right there that he knew what was in Peter's heart. Peter wasn't so much of thinking of Jesus taking his own cross and dying. He was thinking of himself. I'm going to die if I hang around this guy. He said, you not only hang around me, but you take up your cross too. You see the cross I just talked about? Well, guess what? You've got one now too. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life, and what are the next three words? For my sake. Wait, somebody other than Peter? Somebody, Peter, for my sake. Sacrifice for somebody else other than yourself. Stop thinking of self-preservation, you hireling you. Take up your cross like I'm going to take mine. Deny yourself like I'm going to deny myself. And follow me. Do what I do. Lose your life for my sake. Do something for once in your life for me. Man, I'm telling you, Jesus really put it to those guys sometimes, didn't he? Because what's a man profited? Somebody say profit. If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Everybody say his life. For whosoever will save his, what's his life? What's my life? What's your life? You know what our lives are? The things where we want our way. We want to do what we want to do. Who cares what God thinks? We don't care what anybody thinks. And this is exactly the opposite. Again, pray for our kids because they're being pumped like this stuff. Like, you know, they, they, they say drugs going straight into your vein is quicker than taking a pill. It's already in your blood. Well, it's like they're pumping this trash straight into our kids' arteries. Over and over, hammering and hammering and hammering it. You're God, you're God, you're God. Do what you... They won't say those words, but that's the same spirit. Do what you want to do. If it feels good to you, if, if you're, you get the body parts of a man, but you think you're a woman, you're a woman. Have it your way. And they, they say we don't have acceptance because we won't accept them as they are. They can't even accept their own bodies as they are. What are they doing telling us about us accepting them? And, and you know something? Let me just put this in here for sake of how serious this is. 
over 40% of homosexuals and transgenders are taking their own lives. If that was in any other kind of situation, they would be criminalizing that because over 40% suicide rate is people being deranged and suicidal, gone insane. But they're letting it go. And over 40%, and, and not just because people are persecuting them because they won't accept them. This is with people that are accepted as they are. They're still taking their lives. This world's gone crazy. Lose your life. And you know something, if they ever try to tell you this, and kids, if they ever say it, man, I, I had, when I was in school, I had my Bible and put it right on my high school desk. Now, I've I got to watch myself here because I want, don't want to exalt myself when I say this. Amen. So, Lord, amen. Keep me humble. But one day the teacher said, about women on the workforce and all this stuff and equality, and I'm not against a woman earning an income or anything like that, but I am against when man is no longer the head of the home. I'm against that. I'm just saying it because the Bible says man is the head of the wife, period. Don't treat her like a doormat, though, because the Bible says husbands love your wives as well as it says wives submit yourselves. So if the husband don't love his wife, it's going to be kind of a dictatorship she's got to deal with. It's going to be hard for her to see any love in them. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. And I spoke up and I said, because people don't read their Bibles anymore today, and, and I had my Bible that day. It wasn't on my desk. Maybe the Lord prodded me. I should have had it on my desk. And she said, that, you know, I, I said, people don't read their Bibles anymore because the Bible says man is the head of the wife. He says, that's not, she said, that's not in the Bible. I said, yes, it is. Can you show me? I said, yes, I can. Can I go to my locker and get my Bible? Go. She put the whole class on hold that day. <laughs> I went and got my Bible, got it out there. And yeah, my heart was pounding and I was shaking, but I walked back into that class, had my Bible. Right here in Genesis chapter 3, your desire shall be to thy husband and him, he shall rule over thee. She said, well, I'm glad we don't live by that anymore, she said. I didn't stop. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> I live by that book. And snicker, 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 one of the girls laughed out loud at me. Snicker, there's a bunch of mumbling going on. And Mike Bloom, I mean, I'm shy, Mike Bloom. I'm shy. When I was in high school, I was shy. But I couldn't take any more of that stuff, and I had to say something. And then after school was, after school was over, I went to my locker, and I had one of the guys in the class come over to me. Mike. I said, hey, how are you doing? He said, great. Mike, what do you do when, Christ, when people around you are cursing and swearing? You know, and you know you're a Christian. You, you can't laugh at them or something. Like that. What do you, how do you handle that? You know what was happening? Well, some of them were laughing at me. Some of them were looking and came to me for instruction and advice. Praise God. God started working in that high school till eventually we would go to the library and we had talks and chatting with each other about the Bible and we we're making so much noise and you're in the library and, and, and the librarian said, can you guys keep it down? Keep it down. Well, we kept it up for so much, so many weeks. That's fine. Okay, look, Mike, we're giving you guys a room, and you can go and talk about the Bible as loud as you want in this library room. They reserved a room for us to talk about Bible. We need to pray for our young people that they learn to stand up for God and letting their light shine. Hallelujah. Yeah, there's going to be people left. You didn't think I felt bad when I heard somebody laugh at me in class, but I still stood my ground and somebody came and saw that and bless God, I was able to help them be a better Christian. I didn't even know the guy was a Christian. Oh, let's clap unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Lose your life. I don't want people to make fun of me. Oh, you're trying to save your life. Lose it. Let them make fun of you. Sacrifice. Come on. Be like the... You don't think they laughed at Jesus when, when he was doing what he was doing, but he stood up anyway. Hallelujah. Because what shall a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Lose what you want to do. Lose your life. Lose what you think should, think should be like. Let Do it for his sake. Lose your life for his sake. Somebody say for him. Say sacrifice. Hallelujah. Praise God. So folks, the cross was something Peter was resisting. But praise God, the cross was going to kill everything that was Peter's life. All of Peter's ways and Peter's opinions and Peter wanting... Pe he, he, the cross was killing all that stuff. And then the light would come out of Peter. Praise God. And you know it did? How many know it did? Praise God. It, he got back on track and he was the guy that spoke the first day of Pentecost church message. Hallelujah. 
Matthew and Luke and all of them were sitting there and Peter was the one preaching the message. Peter was the one that went to Cornelius and, and Peter was opening the door like the Bible says, here's the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you open, whatever you bind, whatever you loose, all of that. So everything that would make us live needs to die. Everything that would make us have our ways, the cross will kill it. And you know, it hurts us to not see us, our lives, have our way anymore. But that's the suffering of the cross. That's the suffering of the cross. And, and Jesus compared him to the devil, and he let Peter know, you need to start concern, concerned over the things of God, not of yourself and what other people do. Somebody say, lose our lives for his sake. We live our lives when we see these things done for our sake. Jesus said, lose our lives for his sake. Amen. Do something for someone else, especially God. And you know what will happen? You'll lose your life in sacrifice. But like Jesus, how many know three days later Jesus found his life again? <laughs> you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it again. Say Resurrection. Resurrect. We die and we resurrect. When the devil's coming to kill, steal, and destroy, Jesus comes to give us life, but it's not our lives he's given us. It's the life of God. And even if the devil does kill you, how many know he killed Jesus? Because Jesus had to sacrifice when he was killed, then he was given his life back. And now... He says, I'm giving you that same life. Hallelujah, God. Somebody say, more abundantly. More abundantly. And so you know what? When you go through a hardship, when you go through problems, and people get upset and people are fussing, there's people that claim to see, serve God. I serve God. But they're just killing and destroying. But there's others that they're not destroying. They're trying to repair. They're trying to restore. So here's how you tell a Christian if they're of God or not. If they're eating the right fruit. Somebody say there's two fruit. Say one kills, one gives life. Same thing today, just like in the garden. The people that are eating the right fruit are trying to restore. They're not taking that person they've got a problem with and tearing them down. They're trying to bring and restore but the ones that are of the devil are just tearing down. And the ones that are of God will get others. Help me restore. Help me restore. But the ones that are of the devil, help me tear down. Help me tear down. Oh, boy. I don't want to be like the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I want to be like Jesus. And I'm going to close with these scriptures. Proverbs 24 and 15. Don't lie and wait like an outlaw to attack where the righteous live. For though a righteous man falls seven times, he's going to rise again. <laughs> you know what he's actually saying? Don't go trying to knock and make these people fall. They're just going to get back up again. How, how come they get back up again? Because when, in order to be righteous, you, you, you deny yourself. You lose your, your life. And when I see one of my children who's suffered and sacrificed and just gave themselves and tried to bless others, I see them fall. I don't care if they fall seven times. I'm going to raise them back up every time. So don't try to knock out a righteous man. He's just going to get back up again. But the wicked, when they go down, they stumble into calamity. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Don't let yourself be glad when he stumbles. You know, if you're glad, how many remember, you know who Absalom is? Remember Absalom? Who was he? David's sons. What was the problem Absalom had? Anybody know? Self-exaltation. Exactly what I've been preaching all morning. He wanted to dethrone his own dad and be king. And David knew it. My own son wants me off the throne. And guess what? Absalom wanted David dead. Can you imagine wanting your own dad dead because you want to be king? I mean, you're pretty conceited if you want to kill your dad so you can be king. And then, eventually... David had to run for his life from his own flesh and blood son. And Absalom, he chased him like an animal. And here David had already been chased by Saul when he was in a young man. Now when he's king, 
His own son is chasing him like an animal. Man, he had it bad before and after he was on the throne. But you know why he was a man after God's own heart? Because he never fought back. In fact, when news came one day, Joab comes in. What's going on?